Welcome back, my fellow Found My Fitness longevity fanatics. Today is a treat. My guest is Dr. David Sinclair, a professor in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School, where he researches and tries to understand the biological mechanisms that regulate the aging process and how to slow them. I can't think of a more interesting question than understanding the biological mechanisms that regulate aging and how to slow it. I'm very interested in, in it myself, for sure. Well, thanks, Rhonda. Thanks for having me on. So what are the mechanisms? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what is the secret to yeah. uh, the universe? Uh, well, I've been studying this, uh, as you know, for over 30 years now. And when we first started out, we knew nothing. And then we went to little yeast cells, and then we worked our way up to worms and mice. And now myself and uh, probably a couple of dozen other researchers around the world have broken through a barrier of understanding about why we age and how we can actually reverse it. Wow. So what's the do tell? What's yeah. the do yeah, what's the breakthrough? Well, there were a number of breakthroughs. So in the 1980s the big breakthrough was that there are and early 90s that there are genes that control aging. Uh, we call these longevity genes, do not call them anti-aging genes. We don't talk about anti-aging, we talk about longevity and health span. And so these longevity genes uh, were first found in organisms like a nematode worm, tiny little one. Uh, and yeast cells that we use for baking and bread, and that's where I started my career at MIT with Lenny Garenti, running a lab. Uh, and those same genes are in our bodies and in pretty much every life form on Earth. And what we've discovered is that when you go for a run or you're fasting, the reason that those are beneficial actually is because they trigger those longevity genes to repair your body and, and make sure that you don't get as old as you would otherwise. I, uh, just as a sort of uh, side note, because you mentioned these longevity gene genes and the yeast and the worms, um, one of the first, so I, uh, w in, in college, I went to UCSD in San Diego, and I was a chemistry major. Um, and I, I worked in at, uh, biotech. At the time, it was a sort of a, a startup. It was Illumina, <laughs> and I worked in the chemistry department. Mm -hmm. Now it's a very big company. But um, uh, I was working there my junior and senior year in college, and I you know, it was sort of like I was making peptides and doing a lot of organic chemistry, and after a while I just didn't feel like very interested in it anymore. So I went to uh, the Salk Institute to kind of get a little bit of, of a taste of biology, because believe it or not, I didn't have a lot of biology classes as a chemistry major. Um, I had a few, but it was mostly just, you know, chemistry. Um, and at the, so at the Salk, I, um, I joined Andrew Dillon's lab, and uh, who uses, you know, nematode worms to, to understand the genetics of aging. And I remember the first time I was working with these, these worms that had uh, a decreased insulin IGF-1 signaling pathway, um, how they lived like 100% longer and how they were like youthful when they were supposed to be dead. And I saw it with my own eyes and I was doing experiments and it was like, holy crap, this is cool. I, we have genes that are similar to these little worms and they are like this, you know, so. So that kind of got me interested in, um, at least on the genetic side of, of aging. Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, even I don't do all the experiments in my lab. You may be surprised to know. And people will tell me results. Oh, the mice are living longer downstairs on the NMN or whatever. Or we've accelerated aging in mice because we've tweaked the epigenome. And you know, this all sounds great. And uh, you know, I go back to my email. It's not until I go into the animal room and I see them with my own eyes. And these are living creatures that are getting older and getting younger. It really is an impact to actually see it and hold them with, with your own hands. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's the thrill. Even with the yeast studies that I was doing back in the late 90s, uh, I was very intimate with the yeast cells. It, it sounds weird that you could really adore little microscopic organisms, but you look at them under the microscope and they live for about a week and you have to monitor these mother cells and they have little daughter cells that you pick off, used to pick off with a microscope and a little pick you get to know those cells pretty well. You don't give them names, you give them numbers. Uh, but when they were getting big, fat, old, sterile, and then they died, you know, it was a little twinge of sadness that these little dudes that you'd been looking after all the time, or, or females in this case, uh, were dying. So I think uh, we biologists, we, we get attached to these living organisms. And it's really rewarding to see that when we're not making them sick, we actually end up making them live longer and healthier lives. Right. So um, I became familiar with your work back in those days when I was actually um, doing, doing research on these little nematode worms. And I remember 
the, some of your work was on resveratrol um, and how resveratrol like, helped to regulate one of these, I guess, longevity pathways, um, sirtuin, the sirtuins, and uh, how that was in, involved in basically, if you could activate them, and certain ones seem to delay aging. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, both sirtuins and also what resveratrol is. Oh, sure. Oh, let's start with the sirtuins. So when I arrived at MIT, it had just been discovered that there was a gene called SIR4 that when it was mutated would make the yeast cells live longer. Uh, and a fair amount of work, uh, we figured out that uh, the SIR proteins, which are enzymes that control gene expression, genes on and off, um, they would become dysregulated over time. And we found out that's because they were being distracted by a whole bunch of DNA instability that was accumulating in those cells. But the, the lesson was that these sirtuin enzymes that were controlling genes were also controlling lifespan, which was a real breakthrough. No one had really expected to find gene regulators controlling aging. We thought we'd find antioxidant producers and DNA repair proteins. That's not what we found, not initially. And so the sirtuins became uh, very interesting in yeast. And Matt Cableine, who's uh, now out in, out in Seattle, uh, who's a leader in the field as well, he came in and his first project in the lab was to put an extra copy of one of the sir, sir genes, number two, sir two, into yeast. Uh, and those yeast lived 30% longer. And later, Lenny's lab and my lab at Harvard showed that this was through a process of mimicking calorie restriction. If you have a lot of sirtuins, you get the benefits of calorie restriction or dieting um, and other types of little stresses on the cell, like heat and a bit of uh, lack of amino acids. Um, and if you get rid of the sirtuin or sir2 gene, the real breakthrough was that now calorie restriction doesn't work anymore. And that whole setup was the basis of most of the research that the field has been doing since in the sirtuin field, trying to understand that concept of what we learned in the 1990s in our bodies and in mice. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky and happy to say that a lot of it is very similar in our bodies as well. And when you say calorie restriction, usually you're talking about for like, like in mammals um, and, and humans, like eating 30% less than you normally would or something. Yeah, well, in, in the old days, uh, we typically would take out 30, sometimes even 40% of the food of the mice, and they'd be hungry all the time, and it wasn't very pleasant. Um, with yeast, if you're wondering, how do you calorie restrict a yeast? We just dropped the level of sugar in the, the Petri dish. Uh, I think it was fivefold, and that was enough to make them live longer, but they still grew quite happily. Um, these days, um, as you're aware, uh, intermittent fasting seems to kick these longevity genes into action. The sirtuins still come on, but you don't always need to be hungry. You can eat you know, four days of, out of a week or even six days out of a week and still have a period of fasting that gets this sirtuin activity up to levels that we think would be beneficial. Right. Yeah, and there's, there's certainly a lot of overlap, um, at least in the, in the scientific literature, between calorie restriction and intermittent fasting having beneficial effects, a uh, variety of beneficial health effects. Um, but I do, I, you know, some of the differences would all obviously be, um, you know, when you are intermittent fasting, you're, you're shifting your metabolism from um, carbohydrate, glucose, to uh, fatty acid metabolism, and you start to, you know, ketogenesis can kick in after, at least if you're, if you're doing a more prolonged type of um, intermittent fast. So um, there's certainly a little bit of uh, differences as well between, between right. those. Well, one thing that's, that's interesting that connects everything um, is, so we showed in 2005 in a science paper that when you take a calorie-restricted rat uh, and look at its organs, we looked at the liver and muscle, the levels of one of the sirtuin genes, the number one, we have seven of these genes, so we looked at number one because we, we only had an antibody in those days to number one. Uh, it went up dramatically, I think it was about five to tenfold in levels in the calorie-restricted livers. Um, and then we recapitulated calorie restriction in the Petri dish. We grew cells in uh, serum from animals that had been calorie-restricted, and we found that that was also enough to stimulate this boost of sirtuin production. But getting back to what you did in Andy Dillon's lab, we found out that the reason it went up in the dish was because of having low insulin and IGF-1 levels. Because when we put back in normal insulin levels and IGF-1, the sirtuins went back down. Um, and that was a nice link between, for the first time in mammals, the sirtuins, calorie restriction, and the insulin pathway. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, in those days, it, we were all fighting uh, amongst ourselves. We were going through a paradigm shift, which is always stressful. 
And uh, you know, Andy was saying, my pathway is more important than the sirtuins. And then there was the mTOR people saying, no, no, we've got the most important pathway. And I'm trying to say, hey, folks, all the pathways are important. In fact, they're all talking to each other. We showed that sirtuins and TOR are talking to each other. So it, fortunately in the field now, we've grown a little older and wiser and we are in agreement that there is this network. It's not just one straight pathway from food to long life. Mm -hmm. And that you can tweak one pathway and the others will also come on to help. Something that um, comes to mind uh, when you, so you're talking about really this important role that um, calorie restriction or intermittent fasting plays in activating this sirtuin pathway and also um, deactivating things like the insulin signaling pathway and IGF-1 pathway um, it is the, the fact that the sirtuins are regulated by uh, something called NAD, um, nicotinamide um, adenine, nicotinamide adenine, adenine dinucleotide. That's it. So, um, plus. <laughs> um, but that is something that actually, those levels rise during a fasted state. They sure do, right. And in response to exercise as well. And uh, so the reason NAD is so exciting compared to the 1980s when we thought it was just uh, a housekeeping molecule for reactions, is that the levels of NAD go up and down depending on not just what you eat, but whether you're exercising and even what time of day it is. Uh, so during the day, your NAD levels will rise, and if, then you eat a big meal, uh, and they'll go down again. And it's, we think it's one of the reasons you also get jet lag, is your NAD cycles are out of whack. Is it on a circadian rhythm, or is it completely regulated by, by meal, meal intake? Uh, it, it's a combination. It, it will be going up and down uh, with circadian rhythms mostly, but you can adjust it within What that. about macronutrient composition? Like if you eat more a high fat versus carbohydrate? Yeah, no one knows. That, that would be a good experiment. The circadian field hasn't looked at nutrition as far as I'm aware. Uh, but what I can tell you anecdotally is that uh, if I raise my NAD levels when I'm traveling, I feel a lot better if I have an, a shot of an NAD booster in the morning when I get to Australia, which I travel to pretty often. Um, and so I don't know if it's truly working. We need more than one person in a clinical trial. Uh, but it fits with the mouse studies, which is that you can use NAD to reset your clock. What's interesting about this is that NAD isn't being driven by the clock. The clock is being driven by NAD. Mm, okay, yeah. So for people that are viewing or listening, the clock meaning the, the what's reg regulating circadian rhythm. Yeah, how your organs coordinate what time of day it is. And when you're jet lagged, your brain might realize that it's uh, morning because mm -hmm. your eyesight, uh, you know, sees sunlight, but your liver still thinks it's the middle of the night, so you feel queasy, and right. that's the feeling. And, and the reason why NAD is, I mean, NAD is really important for a variety of metabolic, I mean, it's required for metabolism, for metabolizing, metabolizing glucose, metabolizing fatty acids, your mitochondria need it, um, but it's also important for a variety of other tissues as well, activating sirtuins and then DNA repair enzyme, yeah. PARP. Right. You, you could argue that NAD is the most important molecule in the body, maybe with the exception of ATP, but without either of them, you're dead in about 30 seconds. So NAD and ATP were probably the first two molecules that life on this planet used to, to survive. And it's, to me, and amino acids as well. And so isn't it interesting that the amino acid levels uh, ATP and NAD are the three main molecules in our bodies that are sensed as to what our environment is like and whether we need to hunker down and survive or go forth and multiply. And those are the three main pathways. There's the sirtuins, there's AMP kinase, which is the metformin pathway, uh, and then there's mTOR, which is rapamycin, which I'm sure you and many of your listeners are aware. Uh, but we're tapping into very early aspects of, of life that's found all over the planet. And that's why I think we're having such big effects in, in the animals. Often people say it's too good to be true. You know, you tweak one pathway and all this good stuff happens. Well, these are pathways that have existed for going back probably more than three billion years. And we're only just learning how easy and seemingly safe it is to tweak them. Um, do, so NAD levels decrease with age and, and that you think this is um, causal for, plays a causal role in the aging process. Right, right. So what, why is NAD linked to sirtuins? So sirtuins are enzymes, um, and this is my picture of an enzyme, but think of like a Pac-Man that's chewing off chemical groups off other proteins, telling them what to do, like a traffic cop. 
And uh, without NAD, they don't work. They're stuck shut. And so there's always NAD around, otherwise you'd be dead. But if the levels go down as they do as you get older, and I'm almost, almost 50, so my levels probably are half what they were when I was 20. Scary thought. Wow. Uh, so my sirtuins are working maybe half as well as they did telling the troops to go out and fix my body. Um, so when I go for a run, I get less uh, benefit from that. I feel tired. I don't make as much energy. Mitochondria are down. Uh, but by raising up the levels of NAD to when I was young, what I think is going on based on the animal work we've been doing for many years now is to trick the body into thinking that it's young again or it's been exercising or dieting. And that get, allows the sirtuins to do their job the way they once did. By, by just having that level of NAD higher, like it's, it's basically like a signal. Um. It, it is. So think of it as the fuel in a car if the sirtuins are driving. Yeah. Um, and then the resveratrol that we worked on years ago um, works on the same enzymes, but it's the accelerator pedal. So it, it actually, the NAD is making it work, but resveratrol will come along and make it work even faster. So the combination of those two we find is even better than just one alone. Cool, really. Uh, let me ask you this. This is kind of something that it comes to my mind. I don't think it's often thought about this way, at least in the field, but um, you know, because NAD is required for cells that are, have a really high energetic demand, like activated immune cells, for example. Activated immune cells require a lot of ATP for energy and a lot of NAD. Um, and if you think about like chronic inflammation, how you know you're, especially with, as you get older and you're unhealthy and with age, it get, you know basically it is it is sure. increasing. Yeah. If you're having more activated immune cells. Is there any way to test if like the NAD, like there's a triage where NAD is kind of being sucked away to these activated immune cells and like then your mitochondria are now suffering and you get like mitochondrial decay because, because you're, you're sort of shunting all this NAD to like take mm -hmm. care of, you know, what your body thinks is potentially an infection that could kill you, right. right? So there's probably some sort of evolutionary mechanisms at play that say, oh yeah, immune cells need this NAD more than mitochondria or something. I don't know. So it'd be kind of interesting. Yeah. Do you follow what I'm saying? Where oh, I absolutely do. I, I think you're, you're probably right. I've uh, been thinking along the same lines that as you get older, you're, you're losing the ability to make NAD, but you're also chewing it up. And right. the, as it gets worse and worse um, yeah. as you get older, the immune system is a big drain on NAD. Uh, and actually, so uh, is DNA repair right. with right. the activation of PARPs. And, and once you drain NAD a little bit, then your PARPs and your immune system won't work, but then they'll, they'll need more NAD. Uh, because you'll get more damage, and this is a positive feedback in a, in a bad way so that you, once you start to going down the NAD decline, the cells just start to need more and more and more with accumulating DNA damage. And that's what actually what happens in yeast cells, going back to those little critters, that we found that they became overwhelmed with damaged DNA, and the sirtuins were overwhelmed. They had to go over and repair that genomic instability, the DNA instability, and one of the reasons old cells became sterile which is a hallmark of yeast aging, is because the sirtuins are, are keeping the cells fertile back here, but they're so distracted by all this other DNA damage that's going on over here that uh, they lose their identity. And that's a theme that we've discovered is likely true in mammals as well, that accumulations of, of DNA damage distract the sirtuins from their normal job of keeping a cell um, with the proper gene expression and cellular identity. And we see the loss of cellular identity over time in mice at least. And our, what we're trying to do is to raise NAD levels back up so that they can fix the DNA damage, but also get back to where they came from and make sure the cell doesn't lose its identity too much. I didn't know sirtuins played a, a role, a direct role. And I guess they're regulating so many genes that they're playing a role in DNA repair and DNA damage. Well, that, they're one of the first proteins to get to a broken chromosome. Really? Yeah, we, we, we discovered that. Uh, it's a while ago. It was a, um, it was a cell paper in 1999. If anyone would like to look it up, uh, Mills, uh, myself, and Garanti published that SIR2 goes to a broken DNA end and then helps recruit other proteins. Break double, double, double. Really? So like, like, like gamma H2AX? So yeah. So the first thing that happens is gamma H2AX gets lit up on the break, and then within seconds, SIRT1 brings in HDAC1, re helps remodel the DNA and the chromatin so that it's ready for the repair proteins to come in. And without SIRT1 getting there, these other repair proteins are very inefficient. Interesting, I didn't know. But they're distracted. Sirtuins should actually be right. regulating wow. genes That's elsewhere. That's really important to know, I think. 
Right, this is all part of um, my idea, my hypothesis called the information theory of aging is that we're really losing the information regulation over time and all of these other things that occur uh, such as telomere loss and mitochondrial loss and loss of proteostasis as Andy would call it, loss of protein folding mechanisms. This could be upstream of all of that, that we, our cells lose their identity and don't turn on the right genes the way they did when we were young. But the trick is, how do you get everybody to go back and reset? And that's what right. we've been working on. Well, if you think about, as you know, uh, Steve Horvath's work on, on this epigenetic clock and how he's shown now, I mean, in several different cell types, um, you know, including from humans, that there's this very distinct epigenetic aging clock that... So it, what, what, yeah, I gotta jump in because I get, get a little <laughs> excited about this. Uh, what I've been telling you about the sirtuins and the movement, we've shown is intimately linked to Horvath's methylation clock. Really? Yeah, it's all part of the same process. So this distracted protein DNA repair system, what's happening as that happens is that you get the methyls on the DNA that we use as a clock. But what, what we're finding is that the, that clock is, is a way of resetting the proteins to go back to where they came from, that there are modifications on the genome that say, hey, sirtuins and these other proteins Go back to that gene because that's where you belong 20 years ago and ignore these other changes which have come on since you were 20. And we've, we think we've literally found what it, the signal is to get them to go back. Now, NAD is part of that. You need the fuel. But what's the genetic trigger right. to say, get off there and go back there? And we, we think we've found that. And it's got to do with the Horvath clock being is reversed. Is this a new publication? It's something we're writing up right, right now for a, a journal. That's super exciting. That's really exciting. Has there, has there been any, and I know we're going on a tangent here, but has there been any um, evidence looking at, like, for example, like supercentenarians, what their epigenome is? Like, do we know? Very, very little. I mean, they've done the, the Horvath clock on it. They have? Uh, yeah. And is it different than, like, elderly? For the, for the same age, yes, right. And actually, the, the Horvath clock has now been done on people who are smokers or obese, and it's Cancer quite clear. Yeah, uh, I, I think they're tumor it. tissue. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, tumor tissues like looks like ten years older than uh, in the same person, like age match normal tissue. That's interesting because yeah. because we're reversing the Horvath clock with our new found uh, genetic trick, and we're finding that we're having benefits on those cells as well. So I on think this could be cells. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and damaged neurons Dude, in that's the dish. So cool. I'm so uh, excited. It seems to be it seems to be something uh, radically new. But, so I know Steve well, and his, his research is really interesting in that it is showing that it doesn't just predict your chronological age, it's predicting also how long you have to live, and uh, which is a really interesting thing that if you've abused your body and don't, had a lot of smoking and right. been sedentary, Steve can take your blood uh, and he can say, hey, you're uh, 10 years older than you should be. Even if you, let's say you were a previous smoker, or, you know, and you hadn't smoked for 20 years, and you've become active and eat healthy, do you think that mar epigenetic mark is there? Or do you think that, that? I think it is. It's there. Yeah. Well, we know the rates of cancer go down, but all the other damage, the changes to the epigenome, what I've been drawing with my hands, this movement of proteins, uh, that's one way street. It's not that if you suddenly start running in your 60s, that it's all going to Unless be you can identify the signal. Well, the signal, yeah, we've been putting that into animals and restoring eyesight in old mice and um, regrowing optic nerves in old mice. And it seems to be safe. They're not getting any, no downsides And this yet. is by manipulating the epigenome? Right. Wow. Right, so we, we use, um, we haven't published it yet, so I, my graduate student, Wan Cheng, will probably kill me for saying too much. Uh, but we're both so excited. It's, it, even today he sent me a, a, a text about a, a new breakthrough is that we found not, not only the genes that trigger them to move, but then the genes that reset the Horvath clock once they get there. Really? Yeah. If you've identified the genes that can make them move, make the, the, um, the methyl groups? Methyl groups, move. yeah, and, and re reset the methyl groups and what so, gets them to go back. Okay, yeah. okay, So wow. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> give a hint to, to the viewers, um, and maybe this will be published uh, in shortly, we'll see. So we're using the, the what's called the, the Yamanaka factors. Uh -huh. And so the first uh, person to do this. That is. Sure, well, the, the, the first person to use these factors was uh, Shinya Yamanaka. 
a Japanese scientist who looked through a lot of different genes and found a set of four factors that if you put them into an adult cell, say a skin cell, they would go back to being very primitive. So primitive, what we call a pluripotent stem cell, that you could then turn those cells into a nerve cell or even regrow an eye in the dish. It was a, a breakthrough that led to the Nobel Prize being awarded to him in 2012. You just take a person's skin cell and turn it into a neuron. I mean, that, Why that's not? Like amazing. We do. I mean, a, a high school student can do that these days. It's not that difficult. Right. Once, typically with science, once you know how something works, it's pretty easy. Same with aging, I think. Uh, but what we've discovered is that, um, and first of all, I want to give a lot of credit to someone at the Salk whose uh, name is Juan Colas Belmonte, a professor yeah. there. A uh, good friend of mine, and, he's, uh, and he did the experiment that we were trying to do. Uh, so we were just slightly scooped on that. But he made a mouse where he could turn on these four Yamanaka genes. Uh, and that for short, they stand for O, S, K, uh, and M. And that mouse, uh, when he switched them on, died within a couple of days. So that's not great for those mice. But what he then cleverly did was he didn't give up, or his, his postdoc didn't give up. What he did was he turned the genes on for a couple of days and then stopped, let the mice recover for a few days, and then turned them back on. And so the, you know, I feel for the mice because they were headed towards death and they could recover and then they cycled, but actually they ended up being healthier. The premature aging mouse model that he had uh, lived, I think it was 40 plus percent longer. But also he's shown since then that you can use these factors to, Im to improve wound healing and kidney healing. So was he boosting their stem cell pools and their, what was, so he was like regenerating what, tissue? What I think or? he's doing is what we're doing in the lab, which is getting those proteins that have moved around and lost their way to go back to where they were when they were young and then reset the methylation clock. And now a cell doesn't just think it's was young. Was he using CRISPR to do it's this? It's literally young. No, he, well he might have, but he it was a them. transgenic mouse, which means he inserted those four genes into the mouse's genome yeah. with an on-off switch. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't do that. We, we use uh, viruses that we can give to old mice. He has to start from a, a single egg. Yeah. We can go into old mice and within a few weeks figure out if we've reversed aging in a tissue or in the whole mouse. And uh, we've also discovered that it's best if you don't use all four of those factors. We have to leave one of those off because it's toxic. Um, it's the MYC gene. MYC is an mm -hmm. oncogene. But the other three work great. And the results that came in through uh, the text today use those three genes to protect neurons from dying uh, in the mouse but also in the dish and that the gene that r can restore the, um, the Horvath clock was required. And so we're very close I think to, to seeing the future of where um, maybe eventually we don't use viruses, maybe we, we have molecules that can do this that we can put in a drip or in a pill that can send us back another 20 years. Wow, that's super exciting. I'm, I'm like very pumped up about this whole epigenetic clock research and, and linking it to, you know, basically like how, being able to reverse, reverse aging. I mean, I think that, do you know, um, is there any evidence that fasting has any effect on that epigenetic clock? Has that been shown, do you know? Uh, I have not seen that. Um, I think it, what I've seen from Steve's work and others is that you can slow the rate of the clock, but I haven't seen reversal Reverse. yet. Um, and I, I've shown Steve the results I just told you, and he's pretty excited that someone's figured out, or we, th we think we've figured out, why the clock ages, what's causing it, but also what's the first reset that's ever been found. But I, I would suspect that fasting can help, but probably it's not enough to really do what these powerful genes are doing. Right. One, one day we'll, we'll figure it out. But So fasting, I still do that as much as I can for one main reason, and that is that it's going to activate these defenses that at least slow down and somewhat um, stabilize the epigenome decay that we call. Uh, and, but we're probably going to need something more potent to really go back 20 years. But do we, do we slow down aging uh, by fasting and, and running? Uh, absolutely, no question. Yeah, we're, I mean, affecting these pathways, the AMP kinase, the sirtuins, the mTOR, and then IGF-1, insulin signaling, all those, those aging pathways um, yeah. certainly are affected by by uh, fasting yeah. and uh, caloric restriction. And what, what's good about those pathways is that they seem to be really safe, relatively safe. So metformin has been tested in millions of people. NAD boosters have been in mice for many years now and in some humans for a while, um, even clinical trials that I'm helping to run. So that's good, but on, on the, the more potent age reversal, what we call epigenetic resetting, 
now we're playing with fire because we're really sending cells back decades. And if you do it too much, you end up turning a mouse into a giant tumor, which is not what you want. Mm -hmm. We're never going to do that to a human. Um, so we need to find ways to make this new, very potent uh, effect yeah. safe. Um, so, you know, you could theoretically come to my lab and I, I could inject you with this stuff and you could take doxycycline and turn it on for as long as you wanted. And that's all theoretical, but we're not crazy. We're not going to do that. We probably need uh, another few years of clinical testing before I can say that this is going to be usable um, in, in a wider context. But if you're wondering why are we testing the eye, so we're testing glaucoma and blindness, old mice, uh, it's because that's already on the market um, for AAV, so viral use, and it's localized. So if there's any problem, it's not going to hurt the rest of the body anyway. Mm. Wasn't yeah? Wasn't there a clinical study in Japan? Maybe it was where they used induced pluripotent stem cells to like heal some. I don't remember if it was like macular degeneration or some other retinal problem. It was some kind of bl form of blindness or yeah. something. Um, I think I remember reading that that, that study. But just kind of to go back what you were saying about the epigenetic clock and, and the aging, and I had always wondered about with the Yamanaka, you know, the, these, these um, transcription factors that are able to sort of take a already differentiated cell, like a skin cell or a neuron or a liver cell, and turn it back into a, a, a stem cell, a pluripotent stem cell, um, you know, I always wondered, what about the epigenome, right? Is it like, do you have an older epigenome, but you're like somehow, you know, like... I do, you, you actually reset the epigenome and that's how it works. Yeah, so th uh, think, of, think of the genome as the digital information. So this is zeros and ones, or in this case, ATGC. But all, the epigenome is the reader of that and it's analog and it's very hard to maintain over 80 that years. That has to be the key. It's a loss of information. It, it has to be. Yeah. yeah, but how do you get back that information? So I'm going I'm to geek out a little bit because your audience is a smart one. Uh, so back in, in 1938, there's a, there was a man, a brilliant uh, person called Claude Shannon. He was at MIT and he wrote a theory, mathematical theory on communication. And his goal was to correct uh, the loss of noise during a transmission of a radio signal during World War II and, and beyond. And uh, he came up with a mathematical theorem of how do you make sure that the signal that starts here is pristine when it gets to the actual receiver. And what he decided was you can either make it digital or you can have uh, somebody who's observing the signal and then if it gets messed up, you then send a replacement signal. Uh, we now call that TCP IP. It runs the internet. That's how it all works. That's why it works. And we wouldn't have an internet if it wasn't for Claude Shannon's work back in the, in the 30s and 40s. I think that's a, a good recipe for understanding why we age, loss of noise over time, analog systems, very prone to noise, but that system of resetting aging, how do you get the original information back that it was when the signal was first sent? That's what we're working on. That's what we think the Yemen factors are able to do. They are the, the group that sits above and says, oh, that signal is degraded, use that signal. Yeah, that's cool. Well, so that, that's all- High five. Oh, thanks, Rhonda. <laughs> I'm so excited. That, that, that I've been writing up in a book, uh, which is coming out later this year in September. And so I've been so busy writing a book, I haven't even put this out in scientific right. publications. <laughs> so it may be one of the first times that a scientist puts his whole ideas and theories in a book before it comes out um, in peer review. So we'll see. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, th I think it's, it's there for people to, to judge. Um, maybe by September I'll have some scientific papers written up as well. What an exciting field. Do you think other scientists in the aging field will start working on this? I feel like this needs to be, there needs to be a big push. Like there need, Yeah, it's, like, gr it's growing fast. So right now, uh, I mentioned Juan Carlos Belmonte in the Sulk. He's the pioneer. Uh, Steve Horvath is part of our dream team. Mm -hmm. um, there's another guy, unfortunately they're, they're all guys currently, but hopefully not forever, uh, is uh, Manuel Serrano. He's been working on, he's in Spain, in Barcelona. He's been putting these factors into mice. But there, there aren't just men working on the epigenome of aging. So um, a couple of really top leaders. Uh, so Anne Brunet is at Stanford. Mm -hmm. She's been working on the epigenomic uh, causes of aging. Um, and we have Shelley Berger at UPenn, who's been studying, among other things, what makes the difference between a short-lived ant and a long-lived ant, that same mm -hmm. genome, just different epigenomes. Um, and Jessica Tyler works on the epigenetics of yeast cells and trying to work out exactly what I was describing earlier about 
the distribution of proteins between DNA breaks and controlling a cell's age. Um, and so, but though, that's it. That's basically the world's elite teams of epigenetics of aging, but it's exploding. Um, two, three years from now, we'll have hundreds of labs. Yeah, sounds, I mean, this is cool. It's something I've definitely, this, this whole idea, like, has definitely in, in some way come, come to my mind with the, the Yamanaka factor and using that to, like, reset, you know, for aging, not just about making, I mean, there's always the, the okay, well, you can keep, you know, re- re- replenishing your, your cell types and different organs and kind of keep it going, right. but, like, to, like, turn it back, to, like, think it's a young cell. Like, there's got to be a way. Yeah, There's right. got to be a way. Right, right. Yamanaka it's did us a big, like a big favor. Actually, John Gordon, who won the Nobel Prize uh, with Yamanaka, he, he really uh, told us years ago, back in the 1980s, that reversal of aging is possible. And we didn't really get it. What he did was he took an adult cell nucleus from a tadpole, put it into a frog's egg, and made a new tadpole. What that actually tells you is that your genome can be reset to going way back, and aging is not a one-way street. Yeah, yeah. the fact that you can take your adult cell and reset it to a stem cell is, is proof, right? I mean, right, and, but now we know the machinery, at least the beginnings of it, and it's a very exciting time. Yeah, I'm so excited right now. Like, I'm like, there's all this other stuff we were gonna talk about, you know? We, you, you've mentioned these NAD boosters, and we probably should, should definitely get into that. But, um, well, they're central too, because as I mentioned, the proteins, many of them, like the sirtuins, who are moving around, controlling the epigenome, you want to stabilize that as best you can. Um, animals like uh, whales and naked mole rats have a very stable epigenome, so this moving around of proteins and epigenomic noise accumulating. If we're exercising, we're taking NAD boosters, we do slow that process down, I believe. Well, let's talk about what NAD boosters are, so the precursors for NAD. Right? Sure. We make NAD in our bodies. In we, our, in our yeah. So. We do. Uh, and so NAD is recycled in the body because there's grams of it. You can't eat that much easily. And there's a cycle. It's called the salvage pathway of NAD. And it all starts with nicotinamide, which is a form of niacin, vitamin B3. But you can't just, well, you can, but it's not very effective. Um, just overdose on vitamin B3 because you need other things to make the big molecule NAD. So NAD is, the reason it's called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is that it's got these three main components and the dinucleotide is related to DNA, right? But that's beside the point. It's a big molecule so that if you give a big molecule to cells, it doesn't get taken up. So we don't feed animals NAD. And we don't just feed them nicotinamide, which is the little end part of NAD, because it's too, it's too small in that you need these other parts. So NMN and NR are two molecules. So it stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide, um, which is essentially uh, the precursor, the immediate precursor to NAD. If you give a cell NMN, it will be taken up by a transporter, which was just discovered by my buddy Shinamai. We used to work together at MIT, now he's at WashU. A few weeks ago, uh, he wrote about it, I wrote about it, that uh, there's a transporter that sucks up NMN. And the NMN is converted within one step to NAD in the cell. And now it's locked, it's a big molecule, it's locked inside the cell. And that step is carried out by an enzyme, it's got a name, it's called NMPT, and that enzyme goes up under stress and calorie restriction. And in yeast, it's the same step. And so we showed years ago that that step of conversion of NMN to NAD, or in yeast, um, what is it, nicotinic acid to to NAD, is the critical step for boosting NAD when you're going through your circadian rhythms, when you exercise, when your cells are stressed. Um, And without that step, you don't get the benefits of calorie restriction, your organs start to get old. So what is NR? So NR is uh, fairly popular, a lot of people have heard of it. It stands for nicotinamide riboside. And all it is, is it's just a smaller version of NMN without a phosphate on there, so there's no phosphorus on it. Um, so if you take NR, your body has to first put on a phosphorus, and then it has to uh, basically link two of them together to make the NAD. So with all that said... NR gets converted into NMN first, and then into NAD? Yes. Yes, it has to, yeah. Um, But NR and and NMN have both been shown to raise the NAD levels in animals um, and in humans as well. Um, And there's small nuances about the differences, but they both seem to be effective. Um, Not just in humans, actually, uh, I should say, in in mice, uh, but in yeast, they work as well, which is nice. Uh, I, I suppose people are interested in the plant world and what we eat. These same pathways, these sirtuin pathways, exist in plants as well, and they get turned on. Uh, in response to stress. 
And we call this xenohermesis, the idea that when we eat stress plants, we get those molecules and they help our bodies. So resveratrol, going back to that old chestnut, um, it's a grape molecule that is produced when the grapes get stressed. And it's like a fungus, right? Well, fungus will stimulate it. Fungus stimulate yeah. it, okay. Or uh, lack of water. So the, when they harvest red wine, they, don't, they hope for a dry season. Mm -hmm. That'll boost the resveratrol levels and other good, good polyphenol molecules. And we think that, well, I think that um, when you ingest those molecules, the sirtuins are, have evolved to sense the plant world. And if your food is stressed out, your body will hunger down and become fitter as a result of sensing that. Because you know, we can see crops that are dying, uh, or if the water table's drying up, maybe we can t sense that. But little animals that we evolved from, or even you know, a squirrel, it's too dumb to know that its food supply is stressed out. Its body has to take care of that message. Yes, um, so the, the, the resveratrol is activating all these stress response pathways that are basically, you know, in our, you know, we have in our, in our body and, and basically turning on all these you know, genes that are helping you deal with stress. Right. But they're like staying activated for longer and so when, you know, basically aging, which is a stress, um, you're, you're basically dealing with aging better in a way, right? Couldn't have put it myself. And then the opposite, if you spend your whole day sitting or typing or um, you're always uh, satisfying your hunger, your sirtuins and your other pathways, ambicarnase, mTOR, they say, hey, times are good. Let's just grow tissue, go forth, multiply, and not build a sustainable body in the long run. And because there's always a trade-off, mm -hmm. which, which uh, Tom Kirkwood called uh, the disposable soma hypothesis. And it, it seemed to be very true. So you want to always have your body in a state of a little bit of stress, uh, hormesis, we call that. Yes. People uh, listening to the podcast have heard me talk about hormesis quite a, quite a bit. My favorite is sulforaphane, yeah. that the molecule in the cruciferous vegetables. But I've been, you know, the resveratrol field, when I first was following it back in, I guess, the early 2000s, um, you know, I was a very skeptical that there would be any effect in humans um, taking resveratrol because certainly not from drinking a glass of wine, yeah. but um, from supplementing just because it seemed as though like the doses required to get some really beneficial effects, at least in some of the rodent studies, seemed sort of, you know, high, and it wasn't, it didn't seem very attainable. Um, but as you know, this there was a really um, sort of compelling primate study in rhesus, rhesus monkeys. Um, I forgot when that was published. It was like mid-2000s or 2011 or something like right. that. Right, uh, Rafa de Carlo's group at NIH. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, they they gave these rhesus monkeys uh, resveratrol, and I think they started out with a lower dose, like 80 milligrams per right. kilogram, and they went up to like 480. Any reason? Do you know why they start with? I've seen more than one study do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just anecdotally, what Rafa told me, I think, is that uh, they started at the low dose and didn't see a change in pulse wave velocity in the blood vessels, so they upped it, and then that's where they saw the benefit. Oh, okay. So. Um, well, this study was, you know, the, the, the doses were very doable in humans when you, you know, convert. Um, and, and basically, they, you know, feeding these, these monkeys, they were feeding them like this terrible high, high sucrose diet, high sucrose and high fat, and they like, it caused them to have like 40% increased aortic stiffness. Yeah. But the resveratrol completely ameliorated it. Like, yeah. So I was like, holy crap, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I think that was the one study that sort of changed my view uh, and then I started to sort of get into the literature and read more and so there's you know there's been a variety of clinical studies as you know and yeah well I'm glad somebody's reading the literature um, <laughs> because there, there was there was a hate me club with resveratrol uh, because it got so much attention anything that gets a lot of attention gets the hate me club right. uh, in reverse but resveratrol I still take resveratrol um, probably a, a gram or so every a morning gram? really yeah in my yogurt um, I don't measure it out, I just shake it in. So it might be half a gram to a gram. Is this from your own like stash or it's, it's is it a, like it's a... It's a stash in the basement. Uh, it's I've a had private it stash? Years. It is, I'm not a Because I don't dealer. usually find doses of resveratrol above 250 milligrams. Yeah, right. You, you made a good point, which is it, it's a really uh, insoluble molecule. And that's one of the, well, there are two problems with resveratrol. One is it's really insoluble. So if, if you just give it as a dry powder, to an animal or a human, it's less likely to get absorbed. We know that as a fact. Include it with a bit of fat, it'll go up five to tenfold in the bloodstream. Really? And so the big effect we've seen in mice and monkeys is with a bit of fat in the diet wow. as well. And um, then the second problem with resveratrol 
is that it's light sensitive. And so those people who, researchers who put it in a plate with worms or um, didn't treat the molecule with respect, it goes brown, it goes off. Uh, it's one of the reasons it's very hard to put in a cosmetic because your cosmetic will turn brown. Um, if, you, if you use brown res resveratrol, it won't work. So you've got to keep it in the dark, in the cold, and it'll be fine. Okay, so... so um, We're in a basement. Cold, dark, and also, I think there's various forms like trans resveratrol. I, I'd go for the trans because when we gave the cis form to the sirtuin enzyme, it didn't activate it, but the trans worked brilliantly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it, Rafa de Carbo, actually, uh, he's been a good friend over the years, a great colleague. He did the study with us on the mouse resveratrol study that showed that on a high-fat diet, those mice were extremely healthy and longer lived. And their organs, when we, they opened up the mice, they were pristine. So they, the mice were still obese, because so we didn't give them a lot of resveratrol. It was a pretty low dose. But their organs were so beautiful. Um, their arteries, when you stain them for oil or fat, it was night and day. The ones on resveratrol, or well, the ones without resveratrol, were stained with fatty lumps. Resveratrol, clean. And that alone makes me say, you know, resveratrol is probably not going to hurt me, and uh, it may very well help my cardiovascular system. It seems to be really important for the cardiovascular system. Like, and I'm just kind of wondering, do you know why? Why is it? Uh, we, we have a number of ideas, and resveratrol is a dirty molecule, so there's not just one way it works. Um, Sirtuins so definitely are involved. We now have a mouse that's mutant for the resveratrol activation of SIRT1. So we now see that some, some aspects like endurance of resveratrol seem to be through SIRT1. So one of the effects is through SIRT1's anti-inflammatory actions in the lining of the, of the blood vessels, the endothelial cells. Oh. Yeah, okay. that seems to be important. And uh, there's other aspects also in DNA repair as well. Mm -hmm. um, infiltration of macrophages in there seems to be dampened and we also looked at oxidative stress in those arteries of those mice treated and it was way down in the resveratrol mice yeah with the rhesus monkeys with the you know basically like you know completely reversing that 40 percent aortic stiffness that's like pretty it's pretty dramatic effect it, it, so it was, is and, and so yeah i think resveratrol it's people are you know always a true is it not 60 minutes did a story and then there was an argument about how it was working and so people are confused about the molecule, and I, I still stand by it because the results, like you say, in animals, and in, there are clinical studies now yes. that, that are really positive in, in humans. Uh, not all of them. Sometimes it has no effect. There was one study where it interfered with um, endurance exercise. Um, yeah. Don't understand that. that. But that Foreman was kind of shown to do something similar where right. it prevented mitochondrial adaptations. Yeah, I mean, maybe, what, Rhonda, what's oh, maybe happening is that if you're dampening antioxidant or dampening free radicals too much, yes. you're actually losing that benefit. Hormetic effect. Exactly, right. the mitohermesis. But um, but I haven't seen any downside. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a N of one in, as you would say, in a clinical trial. I've had my heart checked out with a 3D movie uh, MRI. My heart looks like it's 20. It's got no sign of aging. So it doesn't seem to be doing myself and my dad any harm. So how long have you been taking it? Oh, gee, since 2003. Wow, and you take about a gram, give or so, yeah. a day. Yeah, there's a couple of studies, um, as you know, there, there was a couple, there's phase one and two clinical studies on Alzheimer's disease, where they were given 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams of resveratrol, resveratrol a day, and both of these studies um, found that there was a reduction in amyloid beta 42 in cerebral spinal fluid, there was an improvement in cognitive function, um, and a couple of other parameters. So. Uh, it was kind of interesting because I recently had Dr. Dale Bredesen um, on the podcast and he has this whole protocol uh, where he's able to, with certain, you know, diet and lifestyle factors, you know, improve um, cognitive function and also by MRI, like help have shown to like reverse some of the um, atrophy in the hippocampus. And so mm -hmm. resveratrol was on his, he's got this long list and I kind of like everything in the kitchen sink where I was like, geez, like what is all, and resveratrol was on there. I never really knew why yeah. uh, until I very recently was reading a little bit of the clinical studies. I thought that was um, super interesting as well. Um, and then the other thing that was interesting, as you know, is the autophagy because um, resveratrol seems to be activating autophagy. Yeah. And um, I also interviewed Guido Cromer on the podcast. Oh, you did? And okay. he talks about the, these three signals that are important for autophagy. And one of them is the decrease in protein acetylation 
Yeah. Yeah, because sirtuins are histone deacetylases. Right. So that would lead to, right, a decrease in protein. That's exactly right. So that's how these Pac-Man enzymes are working. And one of the enzymes that they work on is a, an autophagy protein that goes and destroys bad protein. So it's perfectly reasonable uh, to think that if you take resveratrol, it might be clearing the body of yeah. those proteins. There, I have seen a study mm. with, with resveratrol. So that's yeah, Richard Turner, um, I believe, he's the, that's the study I think you're Richard referring Turner, to. And it probably. looked really promising. And he did what looked like a, a very convincing study. But uh, he actually is still trying to raise the money to do his larger trial. Mm. Uh, and I'm trying to help him with that. But I, I would love to see that repeated and yeah. done in, in more people. Yeah. I know that um, uh, Dr. Cromer has published a study looking at biomarkers of autophagy in humans after, um, after they've been fasted. And I think one of, the, one of those was um, looking at like lice, the acetylation on lysine or something. So uh, it seemed right. to be working. So that's so all very interesting. Yeah. Um, the, the NAD uh, boosters also yes. help the brain. So at least in mice, uh, a couple of labs have published now in top journals like Cell that uh, raising the NAD levels in the brain also improves memory and slows down the advancement of Alzheimer's. In mice, admittedly, I know right. we've cured Alzheimer's in mice. Well, both of times, nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide have been shown to do that in animal studies, right? Yeah, you've been... Yeah, I'm amazed how yeah. much you know. So that, that's true. I would love to do a human study. Actually, yeah. one of the benefits that we might see is also improved blood flow. And that might be helpful for vascular dementia because, right. as I'm sure you know, we've shown that NMN and others have shown for NR that it also helps with blood flow and, and actually mimic exercise and regrow uh, the, the vascular system. And we've done that for muscle. Um, we've got some early results that it also helped restore blood flow in the brain which is badly needed for a lot of elderly people. Right, yeah, no, that's a, that's a big, I mean, that's a big thing for cognitive function. And, um, so NMN was able to do that. In the mice, In yeah. mice, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, um, so with the, with the clinical studies, you know, there's, I've seen a couple with nicotinamide riboside, but I guess the, you know, the, the question is with the nicotinamide riboside, there's been a little um, confusion about like, you know, whether or not nicotinamide riboside is even really getting converted into NAD inside cells in different organs other than the liver. Um, this, was, this was this NAD flux paper yeah. um, that, that was done by uh, Rabowinitz? Rabinowitz. Rabinowitz, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, that, that study um, he recently published just mm -hmm. a few months ago yeah. um, looking at nicotinamide riboside and how orally um, at a dose half of what typically is used in all the other nicotinamide riboside animal studies. So typically they do 400 milligrams per kilogram body weight per day. Yeah. I don't remember how long duration they were doing it, but um, in the NAD flux study, he did 200 milligrams per kilogram body mm -hmm. weight, mm -hmm. which is significantly less than what um, all these other studies, like the one you mentioned with Alzheimer's disease uh, and other studies that have shown improvements in mitochondrial function um, in mitochondrial mutator mice and also muscular dystrophy and all that. So yeah, we, we use double the, that dose yeah, as well. Yeah, so maybe, you know, the, the, this uh, NAD flux study that showed um, nicotinamide riboside given orally didn't form NAD in the muscle, but it did in the liver. Could have been a dose-dependent thing. It would make sense because we, we, we've done a lot of this in mice and now in humans, and that there's a threshold that you need to cross, you need to take a certain amount to, to get over probably the body's clearance mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you get up to a level that plateaus after about nine days. And they may have just been under that threshold, so the body was just clearing it out. Uh, but you have to seemingly overwhelm that clear-out system. So that's why we do at least 400 uh, mix per kegan. And that's with nicotinamide riboside. The question yeah. is, I mean, that's like if you talk about a human equivalent dose for like a 180-pound man, that's like over two grams a day. And it kind of leads me to that ne my next question, which was... Um, the most recent clinical study with nicotinamide riboside, where they actually used a much higher dose than the original study that was done with um, basis, the Elysium that had pterostilbene in it. This dose was like 1,000 milligrams a day, and they looked at a variety of endpoints in addition to, I mean, they looked at endurance, um, looked at... It was a Doug Seal study. Yes, and, mm -hmm. and there was no statistical significance in anything. It raised NAD levels, but there was no statistical significance. There was trending improvement in yeah. the vascular system and 
um, there's, but there was no effect on endurance. And I'm wondering again, yeah. well, if we, if we go back to the human equivalent dose, what was given to the animals, that was still less than half. I mean, so the question becomes, is it not even making NAD in the muscle tissue at that dose or, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, which brings me to the nicotinamide mononucleotide, yeah. you know, like now that those studies have been done in animals at a much lower dose than 400 milligrams. They have, like, uh, yeah, so we, we, in my lab and, and at the company Metro Biotech, we've been using uh, a whole variety of different molecules and different, um, we're doing what's called pharmacokinetics. Uh, so there's a lot of literature that I could, I could talk for another hour on. One of the big questions people ask me is, have you ever put NR and NMN head to head in a study? And we need to do a lot more of those. Um, typically they're not done. And I'm unaware of it being done in humans at this point. But in mice, what we see, and for all the NR folks out there, please don't be angry, this is, this is just data. I don't run the experiments, I just deliver the message. That at the same dose, uh, NMN will increase endurance. And I forget what that dose was, it might have been 200 or 250. Yeah, 200. Uh, NMN didn't increase endurance, oh, sorry, NR did not increase endurance, but NMN did. Um, we do find that for some parameters, and Matt Cableine, who I mentioned earlier, who he works on dog aging now after doing his <laughs> or two extension lifespan. So Matt also has published that uh, comparing NR and NMN, only NMN worked in his, his disease model, which was a mitochondrial disease, where those animals really need a boost of NAD. Um, so one of the issues could be that uh, NMN is, is a better molecule in that regard. Um, it could be that maybe the mice just work better than humans and we need a bigger dose. But what I'm working on, which is not talked about a lot because it's, it's in the commercial realm, is there's been a team of seven chemists working on much better molecules than any of these two that I'm talking about, um, super NAD boosters. And we have ones that work far better than NMN. And these are timed release. These are what we call pro-drugs. And uh, those are the ones that I'm really excited about for medicines of the future that don't just increase someone's endurance, but could actually treat diabetes and heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's. That said, we are doing a, a clinical trial right now with a molecule called MIB626. Um, MIB is, is just Metro Biotech. And that's a, a couple of clinical trials that have been done at Brigham and Wynnum Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, separate group from me, it's all independent. Uh, and they, that's just a safety study. So uh, when I come back on your show, if I come back on your show, I may be able to tell you if we see some actual efficacy, some results. We're gonna be looking in the phase two study at strength and endurance in the, in the, the muscle of people after some NMN dosing. So we're on the, on the verge of knowing if this is real or not for people. Is this the first NMN study that's being done in humans, clinical study that you're doing here? Or is... uh, so we've done a couple, but yes, as far as I'm aware, we're the only ones. That, actually, you remind me to say something important for the listeners. Um, make sure your NR and your NMN is kept in the cold. Um, if it's just on the shelf and it's not in a, a stabilized form, then it will degrade into nicotinamide, which is something you don't want to take high doses of, because we've shown in my lab many years ago that nicotinamide will inhibit the sirtuins and PARP as well and, and interfere with DNA repair. What? Really? Like, yeah. the, like the form that's in vitamins? Right. It doesn't have a super long shelf life. Um, that's not very well known, so keep it cool. Wow. Uh, freezer or the fridge. But I mean, like, if you're buying, if you're buying nicotinamide riboside, you know, from a variety of companies that make it, it's certainly not shipped to you cold. So the question is, how much of it's already degraded just on the shelf? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the case with probiotics. You know, you, when you get probiotics, you want them to be shipped to you cold. Yeah. You know, so that they're live. Um, Right, same thing here. Uh, we have to also replace our mouse NMN. We put it in their water. We replace that every week because uh, it goes off. But that, if it gets wet or it gets a bit of humidity in the bottle, uh, it, it's a, only a short time before it, it's degrading. Wow. And we were talking a little bit before the, before we, the podcast about, um, I was super excited. I think it was the 2016 cell paper. You mentioned the group um, that published the NMN basically that was given to normal mice yeah, without any... Yeah, Shin Shinamai study. Yeah. Shinamai study, that's right. Um, and, and basically, I think it was about 200 milligrams per day, like that, that dose, because mm -hmm. I remember looking at the dose and going, this is significantly lower than nicotinamide riboside dose. And um, it, 
it de- it, sl- it seemed to delay tissue aging in multiple organs. Where I mean, it was like yeah. I don't know. Did it extend uh, lifespan? Uh, he didn't take it long enough. He ran out of material, and in those days, NMN was hard to get, and it was very expensive. It still is very expensive. We're still paying tens of thousands per kilo. Um, but what he showed was that over a year of treatment, uh, pretty much all the parameters of health in these mice were were improved. And if those mice didn't live longer, I'd be surprised. Uh, but we have done an NMN lifespan in my lab, and it's still ongoing, and it's been crowdsourced funded, so thank you for your donations. Uh, but it, already it looks uh, significantly uh, different, the group that's on NMN uh, in their water supply. And also it improves frailty. In other words, they're less frail. Looks like it improves heart function as well. Uh, the dose, uh, I, I can't exactly remember what we're using. Um, it's probably around the 400, which is what's our standard dose, but don't quote me. But yeah, I, NMN uh, and NR seem to do remarkable things to, to rodents. But it, it, like you say, like you brought up, the challenge is, A, does it work in humans, and B, uh, if it does, what dose is necessary to get those effects? Right, and is it going to be side effects with, um, like if you read the, the most recent study, the clinical study, where that, that the dose of nicotinamide riboside was like 1,000 milligrams, there were a lot of people that dropped out because they had rashes and flood. I mean, there oh, was flushing. Yeah, there okay. was. There's some side effects. There the, were some side. It might effects. be with NR. We've never seen anything like that with NMN, and I, I take a gram of NMN every morning. But you said so. The NMN is the reason why there are more studies with NR um, because NMN is so expensive. Yeah. Well, historically, some companies started making NR um, early on and made it widely available and cheap to researchers, in fact, so cheap they were giving it away to researchers. So it became used uh, much more often than NMN. Um, but increasingly, and if, if any scientist uh, lab wants some NMN, let me know. I'm happy to subsidize it if they'd like. Uh, but yeah, and NMN was late on the scene because it was harder to synthesize because it's a bigger molecule, needs that phosphate, and phosphate chemistry is quite difficult. Mm. What are, so you're, you mentioned the, the company um, that you're, th- is this the company that's trying to get a supplement so that for of NMN or is this like so I, I don't uh, do supplements um, okay. and I don't endorse products I'm I you can only do one it doesn't work for both so I, I've um, committed my career to making pharmaceuticals that are proven to work um, and are proven safe and uh, awarded uh, you know so marketability drug, by the FDA it's a, it's a it's drug okay. it's a drug and, and and that's because I in my early in my career I dabbled in in the supplement world with resveratrol, and it only lasted about three weeks before I had to get out because of, it's just, it, it's incompatible with, for me at least, uh, me to be able to, without getting criticized, this is what I think, this is the data, and I wanna be able to say that without making any money off it. Um, but also I, I find that the supplement world, is, it's so controversial and litigious that um, I was scared away. Uh, it's, it's a sad thing that I, I'm unable to talk about supplements by name, because um, I obviously know a fair bit, uh, but I just can't because you know, I've, I've already been dragged into lawsuits. I've lost a lot of money by that. I've done nothing wrong except open my mouth. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there who have a lot of money who don't want me to say things. Um, so unfortunately, you know, I, I really am unable to do that. I do tweet out on, and do social media where I can. I've written blogs about it. Um, I, I'm probably one of the few scientists that tells the world what I do personally um, and use myself as a role model for people to judge. But I never recommend anything because, first of all, right. I'm, I'm not a physician. I'm just a scientist and I mostly study mice. So I don't really know yet how this is all going to play out in people. It'd be nice to, see, to if NMN could be um, available without a prescription now. Well, it would, but it would also be nice if someone like me did a clinical trial so we knew what would happen and yes. what dose to take. Well, that would be, that's the first and foremost. I mean, knowing the dose to take that's actually has any effect, right? It's not just like, yeah, I mean, don't just take some yeah. X amount just because it makes you feel good. I mean, placebo does something. It definitely is changing dopamine and the immune system and stuff, but I agree, yeah. So you mentioned supplements you take, a, a gram of resveratrol, uh, sorry, not a, yeah, a gram? It is a gram, a gram of resveratrol, what, a, whatever I pour out into my yogurt. And about milk. a gram of um, nicotinamide. And a, and a man. And, and that's also in your yogurt as well? No, that, I can just take that as a capsule in the morning, uh, down it with a cup of coffee. Okay. And that's a pretty big boost, I find, physiologically. Uh, those three things, with caffeine included, 
Uh, yeah, you, you can ask my friends. Sometimes I have to <laughs> temper it a little because I'm like a, a, a mouse on oxygen running around the cage a, a little bit too much. But um, it works for me. It helps with, uh, I believe it helps me with jet lag as well or a lack of sleep. I've got three kids, so sometimes I don't sleep well. I know you have a young one, so you know what that's like. Thankfully, I'm starting to sleep well now, but sleep is really important for aging as well, um, particularly the aging brain, you know. So, in fact, I was uh, wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I've been wearing one for a few months now. And um, my son, like around Thanksgiving time, started having teething and stuff, and he started waking up in the middle of the night, and he'd be up for like an hour, and it was like a... So I was basically having very fragmented sleep, and um, my my blood glucose levels, like my fasting blood glucose levels and my postprandial, were like 15 to 20 units higher. And this was like repeatable. Uh, very, I was, you know, my diet's pretty much I, you know, eat the same thing. So it's not, I wasn't yeah. like eating anything like a cookie or anything like that. I mean, it was just like, and. Um, Doing some high intensity interval training did help, and there actually is some research on that. But I was astounded mm. by the effect sleep had, or lack of sleep. Yeah, if you take a rat into private of sleep, it'll get diabetes within a matter of a month or so. I mean, it's just like it was, it, you know, I had read the studies. Um, I had a, a Dr. Matt Walker on the podcast um, um, talked all about it. But when it happens to yourself and you see the data, mm. I mean, of course, it's still just an N of one for me, but I mean, it was just like, it was very. To me, it made it very real. I was like, this this really is regulating my insulin level, my insulin sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I could see my age changing when I had young kids. Oh, absolutely. I've aged for sure. I mean, you can see it. Like, yeah. I, the the you know, especially as a nursing mother, and you're in, in the early you know days of of my son being born, it was just so hard. I mean, I mean, right. it was so hard. Yeah, just check out photos of me in my thirties uh, and early forties when it was lack of sleep and stress and my wife uh, screaming at me for traveling, that kind of stuff. That wore me out. You can see that I aged rapidly. <laughs> um, since then, I, I don't think, and others don't think that I've aged much since then. So it's sleep and stress, yeah. it, all important. important. Do you, how much do you sleep at night? Uh, well, often I'm working up until 11 o'clock, which is a bad habit, uh, but I have found ways to get to sleep pretty quickly, um, avoiding blue light, so I wear those yellowish glasses. Uh, what do I do? Occasionally, uh, I take a nibble of a, a sleep um, sleeping pill. Occasionally, when I really have trouble sleeping, because I used to be an insomniac. But what I've found is the doses that they prescribe for some of these medicines—I don't, I, I won't say which—but um, way more than I need, at least. And so I, I just nibble on it, and it's enough to get me to calm down, and I go to sleep. Uh, and then in the morning, I get my boost. I'm, I'm going again. But I, I typically get seven hours sleep, and if I don't get more than that. Oh, sorry, if I get less than that, I'm, I'm in trouble because my brain needs to be yeah. going at 100 miles an Doesn't hour every work. day. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the Philips Hue lights? Philips Hue is really, it's like they make these lights, um, we have them around our house, that um, they, you can program your phone and they turn red at a certain hour. So like ours go red at sunset and so there's no mm -hmm. blue light coming. Yeah. Um, and it's really like, you don't have to think about it, it really makes a difference. And uh, developing children are really sensitive to light, like even more sensitive than adults. So like I'll notice if we're traveling and we're in a hotel room or if we're visit visiting like my in-laws in, you know, in the state and they have, they have lights on at night, that my son, it's like it's harder to get him to go to bed. And it's, I mean, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm always like freaking out trying to turn off the lights. I'm like, we're going to be in the dark. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. And so I, my, my kids and I, three of us, uh, four, uh, yeah, three of us, we, we got... Um, my wife for Christmas, one of these indoor uh, plant growth, uh, we call hydroponics. And the light for that hydroponic unit, it's about a foot long, maybe two feet. It's super bright and it's in the kitchen. And it was so bright that I was finding I couldn't sleep because it, it also comes on at night and it's just this intense light. So we've had to move it to the dining room and drape uh, clothing over it because otherwise I wasn't Oh yeah, it. like hotel rooms with the cl yeah. alarm clock, it's like the blue lights, like it's like lighting up, lighting up the room, you know, where I'm like always throwing stuff. We've got a HEPA filter and there's like this bright red light. I mean, yeah. I'm just like, who's designing this stuff? You know, you don't want light when you're trying to sleep. And 
So. I'm with you. In my bedroom, our bedroom, we've got lights popping up. Everything is glowing now, and, and they like to put blue lights in these things now that they're trendy. Does anyone not think it's... No, yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyways, that's a whole other topic. Um, <coughs> super excited about all your research. Um, the, the epigenetic clock stuff has me super pumped up. David, we'll have to, like, stay in touch. I mean, um, super... That sounds good. It's so, an understatement how excited I am. Like, I'm... I definitely want to talk to Steve. I want to get in touch with him uh, as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, this is like... Yeah, so the, the people I mentioned, so Steve Horvath, Manuel Serrano, and Juan Carlos Belmonte, yeah. have just formed uh, an entity uh, to fund research in this area and to go into human clinical trials, probably in glaucoma, uh, which is a disease that's extremely hard to treat. You cannot reverse the damage that's been done, and we think we might be able to. So it's exciting times. Uh, the research is going extremely fast, it makes my head spin. I get texts every day of breakthroughs, which is a great, uh, I guess, a privilege. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to come back and tell you more. I, I tweet out some results these days. I used to be very tight-lipped, but now it's too exciting not to tell people about it as we discover it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, totally. Yeah, I'm following you on Twitter, as, so that's definitely... If people want to find you on Twitter, your Twitter, Twitter handle is... Uh, at David A. Sinclair at David A. Sinclair. Okay. A for Andrew. A for Andrew. Um, and you, you have a website, a book coming out? Well, we have a lab website. We'll shortly launch a book website where there'll be information and build a community around the book. Uh, the book comes out in September. It's an unusual book. It's illustrated by uh, one of America's greatest talents for medical illustration, Katie Delphia. And uh, so that's speckled in there. And uh, we've got a cast of characters in there that range from um, Captain uh, Philip, Arthur Philip, who founded Sydney Colony, who used to hang out in my backyard in Sydney 200 years before, all the way through to uh, scientists in London who were making major discoveries that led us to today. And then it projects forward in, uh, what, with me having a front row seat on this field, both in the biology and industry, what does the future look like? What does it look like if we don't succeed, which is pretty bad? What does it look like if our wildest dreams come true? What's that world look like for us and our descendants? Awesome. And maybe we get to see our descendants. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Uh, I'd, I'm looking forward to the book, for sure. Um, thank yes. you for connecting up with me. Big fan of your research for quite, quite some time. And I'm even more excited now about all the new stuff going on. I, I had no idea. I mean, you just started talking about it and was like, yes. <laughs> well, thanks, Rhonda. So. It's, it's really great to be able to talk about it with someone who uh, literally knows as much as I do about the topic. That's flattering. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks. Hi, folks. Thanks so much for listening. If you liked this episode, don't forget to click subscribe. You can also head over to our FMF Clips channel where you can find and share some of this episode's highlights. Until next time.